Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Jean-Charles Prezer. I'm in Brussels, Belgium. I'm very thankful to Nestlé for having organized this uh, important event, this webinar on enteral nutrition in focus on an emerging topic, which is the uh, post-acute optimal, optimal nutrition, which is definitely an emerging topic, probably under, under recognized until now. And uh, so we will uh, address the issues of what happens in terms of nutritional care after acute illness. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat. We will address and discuss uh, and, and try to answer the questions uh, after the two talks. And I will no longer uh, wait to introduce my good friend, Achvan Zanten, from uh, from Ede in the Netherlands. So Ach van Zanten is uh, intensivist, he's an expert in nutrition, he's professor of nutrition in the University of Wageningen, if I'm right. It's a very, also a very active investigator, an excellent lecturer and teacher. And it's my pleasure to introduce his talk entitled Optimizing Post-ICU Enteral Nutrition interventions, strat strategies for maximizing recovery. Please, Art, thank you for uh, being there and for uh, addressing this important topic. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Charles, for the kind introduction and everybody for attending this exciting webinar. Um, I will address this topic, but I will start a little bit earlier in the ICU to let you know why I think that post-ICU nutrition is so important. So here you see my disclosures. I've given lectures uh, for many companies involved in the field of clinical nutrition, and I'm also involved in sepsis and especially in nutrition in national and uh, international uh, bodies uh, involved in nutrition optimization. So we all want to improve the outcome of our patients in the ICU. But to do that and to have an optimal functional outcome with a good quality of life for our patients, uh, we have to follow these patients through the various stages of their disease. It's a patient journey. And of course, the final outcome of the patient is very much dependent on the pre-morbid condition. So if you are frail before ICU patients, of course, your outcomes will be less good than when you are in optimal health condition. And of course, also the acuity of your acute illness is important. Do you have like a minor problem to be admitted to the ICU or do you have a severe uh, well, illness like uh, sepsis syndrome or so with multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. So your prognosis and outcome will be different. And of course, then during ICU stay, we can do all kinds of treatments and put patients on all kinds of devices that can also introduce harm. And with respect to nutrition therapy, it's complex because feeding the patients in the ICU is a little bit different compared to uh, with uh, during health. Because we have this, this complex situation of having inflammation in all ICU patients, actually, and most of them have severe insulin resistance. I come back to catabolism and anabolism later, and they have variations in energy expenditure. Sometimes when you use enteral nutrition, the GI tract is also a target of the disease. And you can have enhanced oxidative stress and problems with autophagy, these cleaning mechanisms of cells. Well, to summarize this, it's complex to feed our patients in the ICU. And then the patients, when they survive their stay in the ICU, have to go into the recovery phase. And then I think in, uh, nutrition therapy is essential. And we start the rehabilitation, exercising the patients, and then we have the final outcome. Is the patient in a good condition? Is the muscle function okay? Can the patient be discharged home or should be going to a rehab center or a nursing home? So that's essential. But you can see in this slide that the final outcome is, well, due to, to various factors and of course we have to optimize all those factors during ICU stay and also during recovery. 
Now, first of all, how you are admitted to the ICU is important for your final outcome. We already knew that those patients with a high lean body mass or a high BMI uh, actually had better survival. But we now know it's not actually the body weight that's important, but it's the muscle mass. So if you dissect the body composition into the components, you see that the survival is more associated to the lean body mass or the lean mother muscle mass than to other body uh, uh, components. So I think it's important to, to notice that what, how many muscles you bring to the ICU is important for your final outcome. And this obesity paradox that patients with a high uh, body mass index have a better survival chance is probably due to having a better muscle mass. And then it's also important to recognize that obese patients can have either a low or high um, muscle mass. So when you are more the type of bodybuilder, you will have more muscles. And when you have sarcopenic obesity, it's more fat mass. So that's important to know that the body composition is important for the final outcome of your patients. Then we know that in the early phase of critical illness, uh, we uh, should not aim for the full energy target uh, we measure by indirect calorimetry. So in the first week, also in the Aspen guidelines, we recommend to give about 70 to 80% of the target to prevent overfeeding of our patients. And we know that overfeeding is associated with worse outcome, more morbidity, more organ failure, more infections, but also an increased risk of mortality. So overfeeding in the early phase of critical illness should be prevented. And this is probably one of the uh, uh, reasons, and this is also a paper by the chair of this session, um, showing that in the early phase of critical illness, there is a lot of endogenous energy production. There is breakdown of body stores, especially glycogen from the liver, leading to a lot of endogenous energy production. And when you give the full dose of your enteral or parenteral feeding on top of this, depicted in this slide, so when the full dose is 1500 kcals per day, and you give it on top of the endogenous production in the first uh, few days, you see there will be overfeeding for this patient. So the best is to gradually increase your energy intake over days. And what we recommend also in the guidelines is to do indirect calorimetry around day four, and then see what is the individual target for your patients. And of course, you will check daily phosphate to, well, uh, to uh, detect the refeeding syndrome. And this is the way we think we have to move on with energy targets over time now. Now let's move a little bit to the muscles. Uh, that's important for the protein dosing of our patients. So patients lose a lot of muscles during ICU stay due to immobilization and also due to inflammation. So they, they have a catabolic state, they break down the muscles and there can be a huge loss of muscle mass. So if we look at the metabolic situation of patients in the ICU, it's different than enduring health. So in health, we have this anabolic catabolic pendulum. So when you start eating, the glucose levels go up, insulin levels go up, and you will store your nutrients into body tissues. So uh, glucose will be stored in glycogen, for instance, in the liver and free fatty acids. And also glucose will be well sent to the fat mass and the amino acids from proteins will be stored in to the uh, muscle proteins. So it will be in the muscles. And when you starve yourself, you don't eat for a longer time, you go into a catabolic state and you can, well, regain these stored energy stores and these macronutrients from body stores. But during critical illness, there is a persistent catabolic state, despite the fact that we give nutrition or the anabolic insulin hormone that's necessary in the majority of our ICU patients. So it's different. Patients are in a persistent catabolic state. They break down their body stores. And this is one of the reasons that in the early phase, also this glycogen breakdown is, uh, well, continuing, although we give insulin. This all leads to huge uh, muscle mass loss. And this is work by Zudan Puticiering, shown with ultrasound of the upper leg, that in patients during the first 10 days of ICU stay, you can lose 
up to 25% of your muscle mass when you have multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And that translates into a, a muscle mass loss of about a kilogram per day. So that's huge. And it takes a long time to regain such a muscle mass loss. If you go to the gym and do exercising, it will take a lot of time to regain one kilogram of muscle mass by exercising. Now, one of the ideas is that we should provide more uh, proteins in the ICU. And recently, there was this meta-analysis performed by the group of Darren Highland from Canada, showing that when you summarize all the studies that have been performed, almost half a gram per kg per day more of protein delivery with a similar energy delivery in study arms in this meta-analysis was not associated with improved outcomes when delivered this high protein intake due, uh, within three days of ICU admission up to 20, 80, uh, 28 days in the ICU. So these were all smaller studies and showed that there was no effect of high protein intake on mortality, duration of ventilation, hospital length of stay, ICU length of stay, or infectious complications. Then they recently published the data on a pragmatic uh, study, the EFFORT trial, with very high dosages. So they aimed for a prescribed dose of 2.2 grams per kg per day and a usual uh, uh, dose of 1.2. Well, they achieved a little bit lower, 1.6 grams versus 0.9 grams per day, and the energy intake was about the same. They had a very aggressive build of protein. So most of the patients in the high protein group were above 1.7 gram uh, per kilogram body weight per day in the high protein arm. And what they found in this study, there was no effect on the primary endpoint, the time to discharge a life from the hospital by treatment group at day 60. So the high protein intake during ICU stay did not translate in this uh, in an approved outcome uh, reflected by this primary endpoint. But they found in the subgroup analysis that in patients that were treated in the high protein dose group with AKI, so acute kidney injury stage one, two, three, and high SOFA score, so more sick patients, they had a, a, an increased risk of mortality at 60 days. So it seemed that many patients uh, in these groups were not able to handle a high protein dose uh, as, as reflected uh, by these study groups. Now, what could be the reason for that? Now, one of the reasons could be, and this is a study we performed during the COVID pandemic uh, among 150 COVID-19 patients using bioelectric impedance assessment. That's a technique using, well, electricity, small currents that go to the body to measure body composition. And we looked at the lean body mass, if you wish, the muscle mass of the patients with COVID-19. And uh, the, here you see the patients. And it's not a rocket science, but you see in blue that the males have a higher lean body mass than the females in this study. And still we don't, in most studies or in most prescriptions, we do not make a difference uh, in, 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 uh, in gender or in sex uh, for prescribing proteins. Moreover, if you take two males with a body, total body weight of 100 kilograms, you can see you can have a lean body mass slightly over 50 kilograms, but it can also be 80 kilograms. So there can be a difference in muscle mass in a man with a total body weight of 100 kilo of 30 kilograms. So in one patient, the amount of proteins you give can be much too, too, too high. And in other patients, it can be a too low dose for them to not lose the, the the muscle mass so i think we have to more individualize the protein dosing for patients in the icu and now recently uh, there are more publications about the urea to creatinine ratio the ucr reflecting the metabolic fate of proteins so when you have, give proteins to the patient they are just digested and they're absorbed and we know that the absorption in icu patients is rather okay so the the proteins are absorbed and it will be uh, well metabolized to amino acids and go and go to the muscles 
And in this slide, this is in a single patient that was in our ICU for about 75 days, so a long duration. And in the upper panel in green, you see the creatinine levels over time. And you see they slowly go down, reflecting the muscle mass. There is loss of muscle mass, and so you will see gradually a, a reduction in creatinine levels. But you see in the lower panel, the creatinine, the, um, the UCR, so the ratio of creatinine, uh, of urea over creatinine, is very variable over time. And I plotted also the CRP uh, levels in these patients. So this patient had like three infectious episodes. First one was the emission pneumonia. Second, there was a line sepsis, uh, so a bloodstream infection. And finally, there was a second uh, a ventilator associated uh, pneumonia. And every time you see after this infection, you see a period of high urea to creatinine ratio suggesting that the proteins that were exactly the same in this patient, the patient received a similar protein dose all the time and had no gastrointestinal problems, you can see that the UCR goes up, suggesting that not all the proteins we give to the patients can be used for muscle protein synthesis. In other words, there are episodes of metabolic resistance in muscle so that you cannot use the feeding we give to the patients or the proteins. So I think it's all a matter of timing and dosing. So energy and protein administration is only helpful when it can be used in metabolic or anabolic pathways. And overloading your metabolic systems may lead to side effects, such in the early phase when you give too much of the energy, it will lead to hypoglycemia. You can suppress autophagy. We know from work by Zudin Puticieri also that the patients in the first week with the highest proteins intake had the most, the highest muscle wasting and breakdown of proteins from muscle stores. You can also induce a, a pro-oxidant condition, so more reactive oxygen species. And of course, we know also high energy intake is associated with uh, the induction of refeeding syndrome. In that case, you have to restrict the caloric intake in your now, with Paul Wishmeyer and Elisabeth de Waale, I published this paper a few years ago, suggesting that we have to have a more gradual approach to feeding in the ICU. So in the first few days, you have to have a stepwise uh, increase in energy and proteins, and then you have to meet the target around day four. And in the late phase of critical illness in the ICU of or after discharge to general ward, we have to increase the intake of both energy and proteins, maybe 125% of your equations or measurement. We recently published a, patient, uh, a paper uh, of one of my PhD students confirming that, well, energy expenditure in general wards is about 25 to 30 percent higher than in the ICU. And after hospital discharge during the rehabilitation phase, this has to be increased further because patients start exercising and uh, we also have like uh, more anabolic possibilities and the patient is able to handle this, uh, um, this substrate. So in the August um, edition of Current Opinion in Critical Care, that was well, fully dedicated to metabolic support and nutrition, I made this graph in the editorial. So what we do now many times, we have a one size fits all strategy. So we, we prescribe energy based on KKLs per kilogram body weight or ideal body weight. We use predictive equations. We use protein dosing in grams per kilogram body weight per, per day. But maybe we have to go to more phenotyping so to, to look at the lean body mass. So what is the body composition? Maybe we use, should use indirect calorimetry to know exactly what is the need of our patients. And we ha also have to adjust for non-intentional calories from propofol, glucose, or citrate. But the next step would be endotyping to know what is the metabolic fate of all the nutrients we give. And then we can maybe use the urea to create in a ratio 
we have to look into like our Q insulin demand for energy. It's more complex, but that's the next step to go to personalized feeding in the patients. And this is all due to the fact they have, that they have prolonged catabolic situation. So the next step is post ICU nutrition, and that's the window of opportunity. But there we have a lot of problems. Patients can have poor appetite, early satiety, some nausea or vomiting, change of taste and smell, what happened with COVID-19. They ha can have like dysphagia, ICU acquired weakness. Sometimes they are depressed or, or have uh, post-traumatic stress disorders. Sometimes the hospital system is not very well, well matched or adapted to the needs of the patients. And sometimes even the food quality is, is uh, suboptimal. And this is work by Emma Ridley from Australia showing that if you have only oral intake in, in the post ICU situation in general wards, that the caloric intake is about 50% of the target and the protein intake is about 40% of the target. And only with the addition of oral nutritional supplements or enteral nutrition, you can meet the needs of these patients. Now, in our hospital, we have more like um, a, a room service system. So you can call to a room, uh, to a call center, and then you can order for, from, uh, from this menu, and it will send to the, be sent, freshly prepared to your room within 30 minutes. So it's like a hotel. But the, the advantage of this system is that we exactly know what a patient has ordered. So exactly for breakfast, lunch or dinner, we know what are the calories, what are the proteins, and we know exactly what is ordered. But what is ordered is not eaten. So we have this digital food charts and it has to be scored by the food assistants and the nurses and they have to estimate what is the intake. So what is eaten from what was ordered from the oral intake uh, that was uh, well sent to the room of this patient. And sometimes uh, we, we, we see that patients do not eat what they have ordered. And we did this prospect one study and this, in this study we measured actually what was the actual intake from what was ordered by the patient. We used these cameras uh, with, with change because otherwise they were stolen by the patients and the families. Um, and sometimes also the food was taken uh, home with families not eaten by the patient. So it's very important to monitor the actual intake of the patient. And what we found was really striking that before enteral nutrition, so tube feeding was stopped, it was above the target. And the day after it, the energy intake dropped by 44% to low values. And the same holds for proteins. So there was an adequate uh, protein intake of 111% of target. And the moment you uh, take out the feeding tube, it dropped uh, by 50%. So this leads to the conclusion of this prospect one study that was uh, published uh, last year, that we should probably continue the tube feeding a little bit longer in the post ICU phase, and we should um, well monitor the intake. We did a study, the Valley Food study to, to to see whether food assistants and nurses are able to estimate the intake of her patients. And we weigh the food uh, using uh, scales and, and, and then we measured what, what they scored. And we found that frequently the intake of patients is overestimated. However, it was less than 10%. So in general, you can say that nurses and food assistants can do a very well estimation of the intake of our patients. Now, the next step is to improve this performance. And that's what we're now doing in the PROSPECT2 study. We made this protocol. So when the patient is 100% tube feeding in the general ward, we, we bring this down when the oral intake is improving. So then we taper the tube feeding in steps of 20, 40, 60%, but only when the patient has shown to be over 110% of proven intake. So we will not lower it in the hope that the patient will start eating better because this is a misconception that you have to reduce tube feeding to induce like hunger sensations in the patient or so that's a misconception and in the final steps we introduce oral nutritional supplements and if you of, of course when the intake is very good you can go faster 
And when it's not good, you go back to the previous step. And uh, only after 24 hours of proven height intake, we take out the feeding tube. And if necessary, we will reinsert the feeding tube. And then we will taper the oral nutritional supplements. And then the patient is on full feeding. And this is what we now test in the Prospect 2 study. There are more studies ongoing. The intent trial on energy during whole hospital stay from Australia. We do the Prospect 2 study. I have just shown you. And the Confucius trial, that's a randomized control trial to show whether high protein intake versus uh, uh, carbohydrate in supplements improves functional outcomes. So to summarize all this information, I think we have to focus on tailored nutrition during the patient journey. In ICU, we have to do no harm. We have to prevent overfeeding and to prevent early very high protein intake, especially in patients with high SOFA scores and acute kidney injury. And I think the window of opportunity is later during ICU stay and especially post ICU discharge. But then we have a problem because there is lack of knowledge of nutrition among world healthcare professionals. The dietetic services are not always available, uh, um, maybe only during office hours and not on the weekends. You have to be aware of the fact that prescribed is not ordered and what is ordered is not always eaten. So you have to monitor the intake and feeding tubes are frequently removed too early. So we need a multifaceted interdisciplinary approach uh, in the general wards with nurses, dietitians, the, the doctors of the general wards. But maybe we as ICU professionals should create this awareness that post ICU nutrition is really a challenge and a problem and we can do much better here. So with that, I'd like to conclude and I'd like to give uh, back the stage to uh, Professor Jean-Jean Preiser. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Arthur. That's, uh, it was very clear and uh, convincing. So we will 